Yo, what's up, everybody? That's right, we back again with another episode. This is your boy Logan here, and this is the Class in Session podcast. I am your host, Logan Taylor, with my amazing co-host, my brother in crime, my partner in crime, Mr. Dante Hampton. And listen, yes, man, sir. we got yes, somebody sir. very, 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 very special uh, here today. Um, and it's a privilege and an honor because the journey that she has traveled, man, listen, I don't know many people can do it. So um, I want to allow Dante to introduce our next guest. But uh, listen, house, housekeeping items before we get started, make sure you all like, subscribe, and comment on the podcast. Leave us a review. If you feel that, if you feel like, hey, man, I love this podcast, they're adding value, please, please, please leave us a review. All right, Dante, let's get it. All right, so we have um, currently the assistant principal of Chattanooga Charter School of Excellent, Miss Ariana Gladden. Um, she's from Stockton, California. Um, she was so smart. She got a full ride to HBCU of Benedict College all the way on the East Coast, which takes a lot of bravery. Um, she's a member of the Delta Theta sorority. Did I say that correct? Delta Sigma Theta. Thank you. See, that's why I asked. See, see. So yeah, she's doing big things. Um, she came to Chattanooga in 2015. She started out as a math teacher. Um, she came up with a lot of crazy little phrases to get the teachers to, I mean, to get the students, you know, to buy into the math concepts and literally went viral. Um, in this in today's time, that's a pretty big deal. So Ms. Gladden's one of those that did that. And so as you can see, she's very determined, um, literally from going from a math teacher to assistant principal in a short amount of time. Um, I'm sure she has a master's degree as well. So just just tell me a little bit more about us, I mean, about you and how you got into this thing. Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Ariana Gladney. I was uh, born and raised, like Dante said, in Northern California. Um, I left everything and everyone in, that I knew in California and came to the East Coast um, because I knew I wanted to attend an, an HBCU, an historical black college. So I just did it. And that's just kind of been who I who I've been all my life. I just go for what I want um, and do what it takes to get there. And yeah, I started out as a math teacher. I'm going into my eighth year in education, so so excited for that. Um, and my first year in administration as an assistant principal. So um, it's a really big year for me. Uh, so it's perfect timing to do this class and session podcast because um, we have a lot of good things coming up and big things for us at Chattanooga Charter. So that's me. Awesome. Awesome. So did you know right off the bat that you even want to be an educator or how did that come about this whole teaching thing? Because you seem no. pretty smart, you know, so I'm just saying. <laughs> um, no, I didn't know right off the bat. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in chemistry. So I have a chemistry um, bachelor and then my master's degree is in education. But um, going into that, I was in um, chemistry. I was in a lab. I have some published work, actually, from the lab. Um, I won't say the title because you're going to be like, what? Dicyanobenzenes and their uh, reactions in the um, environmental system. So anyway. Hold on, um, hold on, hold on. Say that one more time. Maybe somebody somebody in the audience might know what that is. Just say that one more time that you got published. Yeah, don't, don't, just, don't just skip over that. Let, yeah, yeah. So we all know she has something published from the lab, which is a big deal. So yes. just say that one more time. <laughs> Um, it's the interaction of dicyanobenzene, so it's a benzene ring. Um, it's basically chemicals, and I did a DFT study, which was a digital a digital study of it, and then I did the study of it in the lab. Um, so I did that with my undergraduate professor in my junior year of college. So this was 2011. So I was published in 2011, um, and I actually did some presentations at um, national conferences um, on that actual study and how different. Um, when it's in an environment with different chemicals, how those rings react to that and the polarization of it and all this stuff. So I was doing all that and I was successful at it, but I just wasn't fulfilled. That it just wasn't it, you know? So you know that feeling when you're doing something, you're like, I'm doing it and it's something you're good at. So it's like, okay, cool, whatever. But mm -hmm. it wasn't um, fulfilling and that just really wasn't my passion. And all my life, I've always been like the teacher, right? at church, at home. My sister used to quit school because she said I did too much when we used to play school. <laughs> so um, I knew in my heart I had a heart for kids and education. So I was like, you know what? I'm doing this. After I graduated, I was still in the lab. And it's, it's you know, it's better money than teaching, actually. But I'm like, you know, 
this is not what 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 I want for me. So I was still in South Carolina, um, and I heard of a position out here actually at Brainerd High School in math, and I, I, I want to break into teaching so I could get in it as a transitional license. So what that is is you have a degree in chemistry. So I could I could have done science or math because I had enough credits for both. And then I would just go in on a transitional license, give you three years to get fully licensed, take the state test, the practice exams, all that. So that's the way I did it. Um, and so I came in with no educational experience at all, like formal experience besides playing at home. Um, I just had the content knowledge. So I did that, got my license within that three years, um, my professional license. And that was that. And it was just up from there. So I taught math for five years. I was an instructional coach for two years, which is I was over math and science teachers. Um, and then now going into my eighth year into uh, as an assistant principal. So, no, I didn't start in education, but that's I knew that's where I needed to be. And God just kind of orchestrated it where it just happened. So I came to Chattanooga on a whim like, hey, I hope I make it. <laughs> Let's see what it do. And it worked. So here we are. I think Dante's frozen. <laughs> oh, OK. So um, that's amazing. So let me ask you, what was. So going from the going or going through the journey the way that you did, right? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. um, what were the what were the 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 highs and the lows, right? Like, how mm -hmm. were you able to adapt to like Hey, this isn't like science, or this isn't like you know being in the lab and things of that nature. Like, how were you able to adapt to those different things? Um, yeah, that that was challenging because you know you don't have that experience. So, first year going in, I was thrown right into the classroom, and I, I started like a week after, two weeks after school started. The so school start might have started that August fifth or sixth. I started like the nineteenth. Um, so I'm being thrown into the classroom. I'm thrown into a challenging environment. I, mean, I was I was at Brainerd High School. That was my heart. I love, I love it. I, I have so many positive things to say um, against the grain. And um, so the challenges were just really like probably just classroom management. Um, I was pretty good at um, forming those relationships with kids because that was number one. So that was what sustained me. Like my first year kids are probably some of the closest ones that I have to me to this day. Like I'm, I've been baby showers. I've taken them to college. I've, I've done a lot of things with them. That first class they grew with me. So they saw me as green, just brand new. So I think just the management, just really um, getting into like, I'm not in a lab. I'm not just me in here, just looking at chemicals. I'm here in here impacting the future. So it was a lot more serious to me. Um, and I felt like that work was way more important than the work I was doing in the lab. And I'm not knocking anyone in a lab. Like th that has to be done as well. But um, for my passion and my fulfillment, and just knowing I'm impacting the future. So I think the weight of that was probably just more challenging at first. And it's still a weight because you still, you got these, you got kids' lives in your hands. Um, they're with us eight hours of the day. So um, I think that was just the biggest challenge, the weight of knowing like, oh my God, I'm about to impact them probably for the rest of their life. And some of them have come back and said, you impacted me for the rest of my life. Um, and that's the biggest part about it. And, and it really gets you emotional because it's like, you built these bonds with kids um, for a lifetime. They like I reach out to them. They reach out to me to this day. And that was back 2015. You know, they were 14, 14 year olds. They were ninth graders um, and just seeing them grow. So the weight of that. So that was that a high and a low, not a low in the sense of it was negative. It was a low and like, oh, this is pressure. But the high was really um, sustaining those relationships I built. And that's like the most important part of education to me. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's amazing. So I know you. So you taught at Brainerd, right? I know that that is a predominantly African American school. Absolutely. Um, let Let me ask you this: How were you able to help those students that were, in a sense, passed along? If you get what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? How were you able to help those students that were not excelling at the rate as others, right? Like, how were you able to help right. those? those students yeah so you have to close those gaps um because you did have some that were just pushed along and then you had some that were um it was like a lot of stereotypes that they couldn't learn and that was a big challenge just getting over the belief from the community that 
these minority kids can't learn and that they can't excel and they can't meet expectations. So the main thing I did as a math teacher was really gave them an entry point into the math, like started at a lower, lower tier, an entry point, but still held the same high expectations. So we were able to really, they were able to access the content. I hooked them with something, a launch or an activity or something um, made it relatable so that they could get into it. And then it was like, all right, now we're going to take it here. And because I built those relationships on the front point, um, they would do anything for me. So they would, all right, Ms. G said we're doing this, we're doing it. So that's how we end up making music videos. That's how we end up going viral. I mean, it's just, they just, you build those relationships and they trust you and they know that you have their best interests at heart. And when you have that, you can do anything in the classroom. And that's where teachers have to, to learn. And that's what I liked in being an um, instructional coach and kind of teaching them those things. Like you can really do anything in here. Don't, don't, don't live, don't live in that place of, well, they can't, that, that kills me. And you hear it so much, especially in our um, predominantly black schools like Brainerd, and even the school I'm in now is predominantly black and Hispanic. So that's where I live. Like you won't catch me anywhere else. <laughs> this is a demographic I'll forever be in unless God willing is something else. But where I want to be is this demographic because you often have people who don't want to be in that demographic or they do it just, all right, this is a stepping stone. So their passion is not for these kids, but that's where your passion has to be. So when the kids see your passion and they know that this is where you want to be, you're there for them, you literally can do anything in your classroom you want to do. I gave them that hook, got them hook interested in that, that topic or that standard or that equation. We made live quadratic equations on the ground. They were graphing. We had a huge grid in the classroom. We made the classroom a graph. <laughs> so I had all the desks around it. And they were graph. They were on the ground graphing, and they had yarn and making parabolas and things like that. Because I had to bring it to life. Once I brought it to life, we were able to just keep the ceiling going. I was like, all right, now you have that. So now, when you give me all the key characteristics about this function, but they they're looking at it in front of them. It's it's, it's bigger than them. Like they're little fourteen year olds. The graph is bigger than them. But I think really just bringing those those topics to life, you can close those gaps. But I'm not gonna sit here. Well, they they can't. So we're just gonna do multiplication all day. They need to know their facts. Yeah, they do. And we may have a five minute, all right, let's, let's do our hit our facts. But then we're going to get into the quadratics and the algebra because that's what I'm here to teach you. I'm not going to stay teaching you a seventh grade standard and you're in a ninth grade. We're not going to do that. I don't care if that's what level you came to me at. I'm going to meet you there, but we're going to take it up. And that and that's where teachers and parents, we have to have that parent support. And, I, and I'll be honest, I didn't always have it. And it is what it is. I knew that going in. I didn't know that going in because I didn't know Chattanooga, but once I get it, got in, I knew that. <laughs> I was like, all right, okay, this is where we at. Okay, so I'm mama, auntie, teacher, coach. I was athletic coach um, the whole time I was at Brainerd too. So it's like, okay, you got to make it do what it do. But you make it, you make it relatable to them and really, really, really do that. You can do anything. I love it. 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 Oh man, I love all of this. Like you talking so good right now, like just like building the relationships with the students and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really like closing, like really putting effort to close that gap. Like you, you right. what I've noticed with you when it comes to teaching or just being around you, I notice how intentional you are when it comes to the children. Mm-hmm. I noticed that like you're very, very, very calculated and very intentional on the way how you move, how you do things, the way you speak to them, the way you deal with them, the way you engage right. with them, like all of those things. Like I noticed that. And I just like I think that's just like so amazing because as educators, some people don't know how to do that. Right. That's true. Right. They look at it as just like, oh, this is a job. And, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I. I want to go to, you know, uh, urban school or inner city school so I can get my loans, you know, removed or, you know, different things like that. Or, hey, I don't really care about this. Like you said, it's a stepping stone, right? Like, oh, I don't really care about working with this demographic. I'm just going to use this for the next year or two. And then, hey, I'm going to move to a private school or another school where I really feel my passion and things of that nature. So, like, I really, man, I tip my hat to you and I really appreciate you so much. Um, and I just, you know, I admire you and how you move and, you know, your calc how you calculate everything. So I really admire you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, Dante. All right. Um, since the kids call you Miss G, so we're going right. to say uh, Miss G, um, what is what is like a myth or something about educators 
um, in the world that people think um, as far as just, you know, like a common perception yeah. of an educator out there that people yeah. think that's really false? Yeah, uh, there's a few. Um, <laughs> I okay. think a big one would be that, um, that we work our 10 months and then we got a duty free summer. We're chilling. We're living life. We in the Bahamas for three months. <laughs> you know, that whole myth of we're just off. And it's not that at all. Um, even as a teacher, and I know I have more responsibilities now as a leader, but even as a teacher, I wasn't just off. Yeah, you had some of that time, um, you know, a few weeks or so where you did kind of get to just relax, but you've done so much that whole year that you literally need that or you're going to be completely burnt out. Um, but there's so much work we do have to do in the summer to get prepared. We don't stop thinking about our kids. And there's so many kids that even if you're not teaching them, you're still like, yeah, I, you know, I took someone to the ice cream today or I went got their family some groceries, I've done groceries, food, all that. You know, you're still in that mode, even though I'm not in the classroom with them. Um, and then you're planning, Lord, the planning is so much. You're planning for the next year. You, you can't just come in August and be like, all right, I'm ready to teach. No, you have to have your lesson plans. You have to have your unit plans. You have to have some assessments built. Um, you got to decorate your room. You know, you got to get that environment ready for your kids. So no, we're not just uh, working and completely off. And I hear that all the time. I, I need to be a teacher. I need to be off with y'all. Well, we're not just all. Um, so that's that's a really big myth, and it's a myth because it's not true. Like that that that's not what it is. Um, we work nonstop for our kids, and any good teacher does. And you do have teachers that take that whole summer, but honestly, they shouldn't be educators. You know, you take that time. Definitely take. I'm big on your mental health and taking your time, but you have to plan and prepare for them for August. So you you spending a good chunk of either you do it in June and then you know take your little break or do it in. Take your break in June and then get, get to it in July. So you're spending a lot of time planning and preparing to make sure that you are ready and your classroom is ready um, for your kids. So we're, we're not just off. <laughs> we're not <laughs> at all. Okay. Just so subscribers and everybody watching, y'all hear it here first. Teachers <laughs> do not only work six to eight months. They almost work in the whole year. Summers are not off. There's That's always it. work to be done. There's always planning. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's getting into the education field, just keep that in mind. I know you see the trips and everything, but just keep that in mind. Planning is very important. Absolutely. All right. Wonderful. That's great. So let me ask you, let me ask you this. Um, so you went from teacher, instructional coach to what was it after that? Assistant principal. Assistant principal. All right. Mm -hmm. So before we get to the assistant principal part, I got to talk about the 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 moment of you going viral. Right. Like, let's let's tap into that real quick. What was the. What's the word I'm looking for? What was the. Why I put it like this. Why did you do it? Right. Like the way that you did it. Like, I, you know, I said earlier how calculated you are. Right. Like. <laughs> What made you say, you know what, we're going to make a rap song to math. And now my kids are like, oh, this makes sense. This is how this works. Oh, OK, this, 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 this and this. Like, how were you able to how were you able to conjure all that up and put that together? Right. Um, so we we made two videos. I think we're, the, we're talking about the quadratic formula. I know one of them went a little bit more viral than the other. They both kind of did. Um, but. With no, that. they both went viral. Ain't no kind of to it. They both went viral. <laughs> you you trying to lowball yourself. No, we ain't doing that around here. They both went viral. Let's so, talk about it. Yeah, I mean, well, that was a really exciting time for the kids, too. I, I think for one part of it is that's where I, it fell in the unit. So I taught it so that they could understand it for that topic when, within that unit that we were in. So quadratic formula and then factoring. So one was teach me how to factor, and the other one was the quadratic formula. Um. So they're close, they were close in the unit, but um what made me do it, it was it was it was an idea I got from my coach then. I'm shout out, I'm gonna plug Miss Shackelford. You need to do her as well. Everybody knows Shaq. Uh, she's also an assistant principal at Delwood. Um, but she was my coach and she really was the person that helped kickstart my career. I honestly wouldn't be the educator I am today without her guidance and her leadership. So she was my instructional coach when I started um my second year at Brainerd. So she gave me an idea. She was like, you know, you should do some music and video. She's like, y'all always got music um, playing. And but like, she was like, Dale, she's the one that told me they'll do anything for you. Because I didn't know that at first. I can't see that. You're in there. I can see that. She's like, you know, this 
these get like our kids would do anything for you. And I, I see them do it all the time. So I was like, all right, I'm going to try it. So I was like, all right, y'all, we're going to do a music video. It's like, what? Okay. And then I was like, well, y'all all swear y'all rappers, even though y'all not. So <laughs> this is what we're going to do. <laughs> I always talk junk to them. Like we always talk trash the whole time. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, um, gave them the, I, they kind of made the beat and stuff in the background, but I had for the quadratic formula I already had it already um, laid out. So they just had to get in, do the beat, bring the energy. For the teach me how to factor, they were able to write their own verses. So we did that one next. So they wrote a lot of that one. I just did the teach me how to factor, like teach me how to Dougie. Um, and then they wrote that whole rap. And what I did is I just combined all the kids that really, 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 really want to do it. Every class did it. But you have those kids that want to be on camera. And you have those kids that are like, Missy, please don't make me get on the camera. I'm going to do it in class. But I don't want to be on the camera. And I have to respect that. Absolutely. Them. I have to respect that. So I have some that I'm like, all right, y'all, you're going to do it in the class, you know, practice. You know, it's still part of the learning process. When I do the tape, then I'll let you guys step out and go next door. Um, I think I sent something like Mr. Graham class and stuff. Like, all right, y'all go to the other class. We're going to film now because we're going to do it right. I, like you said, I'm very calculated. We're not going to go out here half stepping. Because if I'm going to go viral, it's going to be a viral for a good reason. So we're going to do it right. So, um, so yeah. So we just, we had about three takes, maybe, maybe about three takes. Um, cause I watched one. I'm like, Oh no, we need more energy here. You get on that desk. It was like, I thought I was a director. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> choreographing over there. She choreographing over there. All right, she, got, she got creative director in her, in her blood. Yes. She got creative Love director in her blood. Love y'all. Yes. Like, and I was, I, I, I said all that. I was like, you know, I was a stepmaster in college and we won all the step shows. So I know what I'm doing. You know, I, I did that whole spiel. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was directing whatever. So I think, they just kind of took it. It was their energy. Like, it's more of them in the video than me. Like, it was their energy. So they really, I mean, I gave it all, all the accolades to the kids. Like, they brought it. They put their calculators to their ears, doing all this. I didn't tell them none of that. Like, they went they went there with it. They got on top of the desk. One little boy made the beat and all that. So, I mean, for one, like I said, it was just part of where we fell in the unit. And then I just knew I wanted to do something to really highlight them and change that um, image that Brainerd kids were less than. And that was my main goal with it. It's really high. I always highlighted my kids at Brainerd um, because I so, so many times heard in the community how they're less than, how they're not, they can't exceed. Like my honors class, when we take our standardized tests and this shout out to them, they were beating the, the whole, we would get all the district scores. Their average was beating the whole district. Like for real, for real. And algebra one, my, my honors class, like I'm looking at East Hamilton, I'm looking at Signal Mountain. I'm not, I'm not dogging anybody. Please understand my heart. My heart is to shout out my kids at Brainerd. They were beating everybody. And I'm very competitive. But and I would tell them that. And I'm like, this we were we're breaking, we're breaking um barriers and and breaking stereotypes of them. So that was a main goal of mine. Like a stereotype, yeah, they 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 can't learn, they can't this or that. They're not going to act right in class. No, they know they put together an entire music video and they're not only having fun, but they're over here beating an entire district in an average on a standardized test. You know how challenging those those exams are because they put the work in. We were they would come to school on Saturdays. We were having Saturday camp. We were wow. having what I call it boot camp. Wow. We were boot camp to, to break these um to break that mold because like. Nah, y'all not gonna do my kids like that. And I get real serious about that. <laughs> so I, it was just really just highlighting them and like we have fun here. Um, but we learn and they can do it. I love it. I love it. She said, listen, y'all ain't finna do my kids like this. We not I who I think y'all talking to. <laughs> we not also highlight though, also highlight that um uh, just for the viewers out there, just to make sure y'all understand. Um Miss G, actually, the concept of this is pretty big because and we live in today's time where everything goes viral. And so that correlation is huge for those kids. So, of course, those kids are going to have a lot of energy because yeah. you're dealing with the number one thing that's driving everything right now, which is social media. So for all the listeners out there, if you can be creative and meet meet your students or your kids at that brink, um, like you said, they will run through walls for her. So let's just keep that in mind as everybody who's viewing future teachers, educators, mentors, um, counselors, whatever they may be, just keep that in mind. So that's, that's pretty cool, by the way. Because you're right about that. The kids started sharing it. So that was even bigger. We weren't even talking about adult sharing. All the kids started sharing from all surrounding schools. So it would awesome. be schools at like 
you're like my boyfriend at school and stuff like oh yeah we, we we saw your girl her class went viral wait we want to do that in class so there it was it was like change it was shifting the culture of math because kids quote unquote hate math and and you get you do run into that unfortunately so it was kind of shifting that culture of well, you can still have fun in math so i'm having kids from other schools i'm hearing about like sharing those videos you know the kids they all know each other but they all brainer tyner howard everywhere they all knew each other so they were all sharing it um and that's where it was kind of like okay well we want to we want to do stuff like that we want to learn in math but math can be fun so that was another big thing about that is the kids tapped into it not only the adults so they started seeing the value in math so yeah I love it. I love how you I love how you met the students or better yet, the scholars. I love how you met the scholars where they were. And then just basically you were that foundation and then you just kept rising them up and kept helping them meet the expectation that you had set for them. Right. Right. I love that. I love that. I love that. All right. So quick question. We got a hot seat question for you. And I'm going to let Dr. do this because. This is his baby. So Dante, go ahead and do this hot seat question real quick. Oh Lord. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see here. So is there a number or a value that a teacher or educator can make to where you say, okay, that works? And before you answer, we done had all kind of answers. We don't judge. It can be high, it can be low. Whatever, whatever cross your mind. And the only reason we ask this is because we have we're dealing with a lot of teacher burnout as far yeah. as teachers being overwhelmed, don't want to do it. Right. So whatever you think is the number you tell us or, you know, some people say there's not no number. You know, it's yeah. just a thing that you do with your heart. So you let us know. <laughs> and you're a principal now, too. So, you know. This right. Is right. So um, we're talking about a dollar, a, a value, a, a salary. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And you can and you can break it down. You can say, you know, first first year educator or, you know, somebody who's been tenured there, you know, been in the business 10 years. Yeah, I think it's different tiers to it and like different degrees. Um, those do play a factor because um, you do get a boost like I have my master's and if you have a doctorate, um, I would say just starting out as a base salary. I know when I started out in 2015, it was I think 36,000. It, it was low, y'all. It, they, they, that was wrong. Um, and it still is low. I would say starting out first year, no experience, just maybe your bachelor's um, degree. I would say it should be no lower first year than probably between 50 to 55,000. First year, like just fresh, no experience. Because um, you put in a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Um I think, you know, going into like administration, I think the base should probably be now that this is a lot of work. <laughs> and I ain't even all the way haven't started the year, but I've I'm already doing the work, um, some of the work now. I would say base for going there first year, like say me, first year starting out, I would say, I would say no lower than eighty five. No lower than eighty five. Okay. Okay. But, um, and then I guess probably if you have a doctorate, then probably 95 to 100. Okay. That ain't bad. That ain't bad. Okay. Lo, she, she too nice, Lo. She too nice. I, I mean, am she really nice. want to say Mo. She, she really trying to be modest, but I I'm going to let that slide. I know. I know. Cause she trying to be modest. Cause oh, my God. Here's what here's what we said, Miss G. Well, here's what I said. Dante said another number. But the reason why we asked that is because we're – you. These past two years, maybe three years, we've noticed how educator burnout has skyrocketed to a whole nother level. Whole nother level. Right? There's there level. are studies that show that, you know, it was somewhere between like 20 to 30 percent, and then it just went up to like, I think it was like 58 to 60 to 58 to 63 percent in certain uh states and stuff like that and so it's like you're telling me that more than half right mm -hmm. of teachers or educators right they're literally just giving up on something that they that they quote unquote have a passion for but right. they're giving up on it because of mental health self-care right they're burning out right and they're tired right. so 
me and Dante have this conversation all the time. I feel that there should be some type of incentive for you all, right? Whether oh, if it's yeah. dealing with housing, whether it's dealing with a vehicle, um, something like that, because we just asked another guest. I mean, we asked all of our guests this, but um, our most recent guest, we had a conversation with him and I told him, yo, I feel the need that the bare minimum need to be 80,000. Love it. Like I really, I really, I really love believe it. that because love. look at I know I know all of the work that you all do, right? Like you oh, get yeah. paid for quote unquote 37 and a half or 40 hours, depending on you know what I'm saying, where mm -hmm. you at in, in which state. Right. But you but you put in 60, 70 hours a week. Uh-huh. And you're not getting paid for that, right? Like you can go somewhere else, work at a fast food or a call center. You put in 70, if you, anything over 40 hours, you getting time and a half on that. Right. So why can't teachers get that same thing? You're right. Especially when you all are moms, dads, aunties, counselors, like you're more than just a teacher. Like you, you said that I was more than just a math teacher. I was mom. I was auntie. I was, right. you know, you taking kids to college, like all of those different things. Right. right? And so I think that just being able to compensate you all from a from a point, I feel like that should be a starting point, right? Because I'm yeah. like, you're like, let's don't just tell somebody you appreciate them. Like, yeah, that's great, but I need you to show them. That's true. I agree. Let's let's show you, let we, you know, let's show you with our actions. Because it's like, why should a first year teacher be getting paid thirty thousand dollars, but she dealing with kids and she's trying to close the achievement gap in certain areas of kids or you have a kid that has an IEP and so now he needs a para and he needs extra things and extra services or you know you're dealing with kids you're dealing with RTIs and you're dealing with tier one kids tier two kids tier three kids yep. or you have some kids that they're on a like you said you had a kid that was in the ninth grade but he was on the seventh grade reading level so you had to put more work and more time and energy into that right and so it's like no, like we need to, we need to really show y'all that we care because y'all deal with so much. Yeah, you're right. It's so many moving parts. And like you said, the tears, RTI, all that. It's it's so much. So I I, I guess I, I did a little wallet, I guess. <laughs> I know you were trying to play nice. No, no, trying to be nice. He called you out. He said, bro, she trying to play nice. He called you out. <laughs> I knew it. Go ahead, Dante. Go ahead. All right. So we're going to go on a larger scale right here, larger scale. Mm -hmm. if, if there's if there's something you could change about the education system on a large scale, um, what would that be? Whether that be, um, you know, the requirements to be a teacher, you know, whether that be certifications, whether that be standardized testing, just a few examples. Um, for me, like I talked to Logan, I don't like the grading scale. Um, there's no way, kind of like in other sports, like, like basketball, for example, like high school doesn't have a shot clock, but you have a shot clock in college. Mm -hmm. I think everything should correlate. So right. for me, I think if we're going to grade college 80 to a 90 is a B, then kids in high school should be getting that same. There's no reason I have a kid who has a 84, has a C, and he's literally one or two points from a B. doesn't make sense to me. And you're talking about kids who that's probably you're talking about a 40 percent chance of a lot of kids not going to college because of those 84s yeah if not higher um but yeah just if anything you know name something that you might think education systems would change on a larger scale yeah yeah i agree i definitely agree with the grading scale yeah because a 93 is an a 92 is a b that's beyond me it should definitely be 90 to 100 80 to 90 you know 80 to 89 70 79 like that um I would say, um, in, this, in addition to that, definitely the standardized testing. Um, I am the, the building testing coordinator, so I'll, I'll tread lightly. Uh, but I do. No, don't don't hold back. Don't hold this podcast. Now, don't be trying to hold back on us now. Okay, <laughs> let me get fired. Um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Y'all gonna have me fired? Y'all gonna have a job? Am I gonna be with YB Normal? Yeah, we All got right. you. We got you. <laughs> Hey, we'll create a position for you. Come on. Come on. You can be a part of the <laughs> curriculum team. Come on. Come on. There we go. <laughs> um, I am not a fan of standardized testing. Um, not a fan at all. It, it is it's just a big 
pressure um, on the teachers, on the kids, on the testing coordinator. People lose their jobs over this. Like it's it's beyond me. I, I, I it is not anything that I think should measure um, what our kids have learned. And I get the point of it's more of an assessment on the teacher, actually, because it's like, okay, well, your kids are this or that, so now you're deemed a terrible teacher or you're deemed an excellent teacher. And that's not fair because for one, you're going to have kids that come in and don't give a care about it, unfortunately. So they may just bomb it, even though you taught them all that material and you put in your 80 hours <laughs> a week to teach them that and your Saturdays and your times. And, and, and some kids just can't perform well on standardized tests. Some people are not great test takers. So when I did have my boot camp, I would do a lot of testing strategies. And I think that's to help my kids a lot. Because it, the the wording of the test, for one, it was never for for um, minority. You know, we it was so culturally biased. Um, and then you would have the way they would ask a question would be, "Come on now, you don't even have to ask that. If you really trying to measure what they know? Then say, okay, we do do the standardized test, but don't try to trick them. So if you want to measure them, okay, we want to measure. We do do assessments to measure, but we do assessments all year to measure." So why, why can't we use that to um, evaluate how the teacher taught those standards and how the kids learned it? Well, you want to do a standardized test? All right, boom. Don't try to trick our kids within that test. For one, it's culturally biased. For two, you ask the question within a question within another question. So they don't even know which question they're answering. So now you got a kid messing up on um, equations when they know how to solve an equation. If you want to know if I taught them how to solve an equation, I did. But the way you're asking the question is going to make trip them up. And you know that. So then you, you're, it's like you're trying to trick the kids. So that's what I hate about standardized tests. It's like you're trying to trick them, though. The way I'm reading it, you done tricked me. Because I'm like, hold on. Hold on. What? What are they asking them to do? So I had to start, start teaching my kids how to understand what the question is actually asking them. So now I got to teach you a strategy and a trick to take standardized tests. That doesn't make sense. I shouldn't have to teach you the tricks. I should just teach you the math. Why am I teaching you the tricks for a test from the state? Because they want to trick you. What message are we sending to our kids? We're not sending the message that we just want to know what you learned. No, we want to know if you know how to read, read this question inside out and read between the lines. That's not teach. You're not. So then you can't say, well, she didn't teach them the math right. No, I didn't teach them how to read between the lines, I guess. I guess I didn't teach them your tricks. So that's what I hate, hate about the standardized test. Not even so much of having it, but the way it's presented. Um, but then just on top of it, it's just it, it causes a lot of stress for the teachers and, and the scholars. Um, and I hate that part of it. So that would be a big change like that. That has to change. Um, and then also just going into teaching and, and a lot. You had to do so much to get certified. I went through a lot getting certified. And it's like, yes, you want to make sure you're putting the best before our kids. We always want to do that. So there, there does need to be some sort of certification process, hands down, and making sure they understand how to teach and understand whatever it is that they are teaching. But the extras, like this new, this new Ed TPA, no, 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 brother, like no, 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 no. That's uh, so unnecessary, completely unnecessary. Like we, no, I don't even go into all the details on that, but that is so unnecessary to me. So certain things is just like. Let's let's okay, yeah. Make sure they have a test, they know their, their content, make sure they understand some of the some of the pedagogy and things like that of teaching, and then let's go from there. And then if people are not a good fit, then they, they're gonna eliminate themselves anyway. But all the extra, you have people walking away because of no, nah, I don't even want to go through all that and spend all that money to get certified. I have good people that walk away because they're like, nah, it is too much trying to get it, trying to trying to get in. It, and it's it's unfair because you have people that really have a heart for our kids. Who could be successful? Who would know how to build the relationships? They just I'm can't get through this people, whole process, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yes, you're, you're, you're great. You're great for our kids, but it's too much to get in. Like, golly, but you want us to do all that to get in, and you want to pay us forty thousand starting out? Are you kidding me? You're doing all that, like they about to go perform surgery, but then the doctors get to start at ninety thousand, and we start at forty. And I went through all these years of schooling and all these tests and all this money you're putting out that they're not paying for half the time. So, or most of the time. So yeah, I think standardized testing, how to get in, the grading, 
those are just a few of the other big ones. It's a few things, but yeah. All right, all right. What you got, Lo? What, what you got for? So, you know, what I, hey, listen, no, we good. So, um, I want to, I want to ask, what made you go from teacher to assistant principal? Like, what, what was it? Did you feel the need to be like, hey, I want to move up in education, or was it just like? you know what, I want to try something new or were you just like, you know, what, like, what was it? What gave you that spark to be like, Hey, I want to be an assistant principal. So I didn't, I didn't see that at first. Um, at first, probably about three years, I started getting into leadership, like the uh, department chair, team lead, things like that. Um, after my second year, I started getting to getting into those positions. I still didn't see any, anything beyond that at at that point, I still was like, no, nah, I love it in the class. I'll never leave the classroom. I remember saying that. Um, <laughs> girl, yeah, you did. You left. Um, and it was like, you're, you've you accomplished so much in that. And it's not a, and I say that humbly, but you, I've accomplished so much in the classroom and as a teacher. And it's like, all right, there's got to be something else. Um, also another challenge, but also another way to impact more kids. So I thought about it like that. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm impacting my class. And so what, a total of 80 to 100 because, you know, you have those class periods. So I'm not like, you know, elementary majors have their 25. Right. All right. I'm impacting my 100, say 100 kids. What, how can I impact more than that? Um. So then that's when I started thinking about coaching. And like I said, my, and Shaq, my coach then was like, she's like, no, you're going to be a, um an assistant principal one day. And she told me that like my third year. And I was like, girl. All right, whatever. So you ready to go to lunch? Like, so I'm not even talking to you. So then, um, so then I was like, okay, thinking about coaching. I was like, okay, that's the next step from here. I was like, you know what? If I can teach teachers to teach like I teach, then now we're impacting a whole school. And we're not just impacting my kids in Miss G's classroom 210. So that's when I went and started to get into coaching. Um and I love that leadership aspect of things. I I, I, I could be a bossy person. So I knew I had leadership in me. I like, and that's not what leaders are, just bossy. But I knew I had that nature of, I'm not afraid to tell somebody what it is, but also be respectful and professional at the same time. So I was like, okay, I can get into coaching. Uh, I've always been a natural leader. So got into coaching and been doing that. And then um, loving it, loving being in classrooms, side by side, teaching teacher strategies, best practices how to teach well, how to really build those relationships relationships with our kids. Um, and been doing that the last two years. And the position kind of, the way things fell this whole time for me, things started just falling in my lap. The coaching one did, I, someone reached out to me. And that's why I ended up leaving Brainerd. It wasn't leaving up because I needed to leave. It was just another time for another part of my journey. Cause I had been in Brainerd five years. Um, so I knew I needed to know other schools. And and it was a promotion. So that's how I got into the coaching. And then the assistant principal, um, yeah, the position was open. And then my principal, I know you guys already interviewed C, Dr. C, she was like, you know, we, you know, we got the assistant principal position and this and that. And she said, I know you're you're already starting your um certification for that. That I'm already, I'm in school now. Um, I'll be done with that in December. She was like, I know you've already started that. So she said, um, and that's this is that's a journey to Lord. Um, and she's like, just, you should just, you know, apply for it. Let's see. And it was kind of one of those, like, okay, you want me to do this? Cause you clearly want me to maybe be on this team with you. Um, and that is what I wanted to do either that or high school. Um, so I'm like, okay. So I just started, we went through the whole process and it was just a great fit, like a great fit. Just moving right into that role. I'm moving right into that role in the same school. So I already know a lot of our kids, um, some of our teachers. We got some new teachers coming on board. But it was just one of those, like, perfect transitions to go into that. I was already doing a lot of that work as a coach. You're kind of in between. So you are doing some of those administration things, whether it's official or not. And um, so it was kind of one of those, you know what, I could just transition into that. And it was just perfect. So um, I've been doing that work all, all summer now. Um, and I already started doing a little bit of it last year because we had a vacancy for a while. So um, it was just perfect fit. It wasn't one of those shoe ins because you're here. I had to go through the whole process like as if I was off the street. The interview, second interview, you know, all those things um, with our leadership team. But 
it, to everyone, it was just a perfect fit. So just going straight into that um, at the same school, I think it's going to be really good, really getting my feet wet as my first year, but at a school I know. So I'm not walking into something blind like, oh, Lord, this is what they do here. I kind of already know how things are and I already know what needs to be improved and what needs to stay the same. You know, sometimes you come in and want to change everything and some things are not broken. So I think being there already two years helped me to know things that, yeah, we can sustain that, but let's tweak this. Um, so that's what I'm most excited about is that I've already been there. I'm not coming into something brand new and just trying to change whatever um, culture was already built. We're just going to build it up from here and already working with C for a year. Um, so us going into this journey, you know, together. So everything honestly was just what was orchestrated perfectly. I, I can't even lie. Like a lot of it was not even me. It, it was just it was just my journey and it just happened. And I'm not saying it was easy at all, but the way things fell and aligned. It was just boom, 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 and everything was growth. Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't even know what else to say about it. It just, it just happened. But I'm excited for it, you know. But if you would ask me that, well, I was asked my third year. I said I would never go into administration. I'm never leaving the classroom. I'm being here with my kids for life, for life. <laughs> <laughs> and they, had a, they was mad when I left. They, oh, they went off on me. We didn't talk about that. <laughs> Bring the kids. They, they went off on me. Because high school kids know how to talk. I mean, they know how to communicate. This ain't, these aren't elementary kids. That, no, they have phones, social media. Yep. Call me up. But it was just growth. So. I love it. I love it. Well, congratulations on your journey. Um, as well as, let me ask you this. So you are, you go from math teacher to instructional team lead department we go to um, assistant principal, right? Mm -hmm. What, and let's, 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 let me say this as well. So you are a middle school assistant principal. I am. What was the difference now that you, now that you are teaching middle school, what, what are the differences that you're noticing with teaching high school students being in a, being in an African-American school? Right to going to being an assistant principal and teaching mm -hmm. at a middle school where you're dealing with African-American kids as well as Hispanics? Um, the biggest difference, and I, high school is still also my heart. So eventually, like later, later on down the line, I probably will still transition back to high school. Um, it's, it's a, I, I can, I can, I can talk to them a little bit more. I can be a little more real. Um, and you can do that with middle school. I will say this. I will never do elementary. Um, I, I can't do the crying and the, 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 um, extra neediness. Can't do it. But, um, <laughs> I love my babies, but I would never, <laughs> ever in life ever. So, um, middle school, I, I think the biggest difference was just, they're not, you know, high school kids. I mean, kids are still kids. They're not totally mature, but they're more mature than, um, middle school was. So, I did like that I could have those real conversations. I have I had my girls. We had some real conversations about life, about sex, about boys. And they're in that stage a little bit in middle school, but they're kind of not. So it's kind of like treading, treading that lightly, like, hey, I don't want to introduce some things they're not even talking to their parents with about yet, things like that. Um, but in high school, they're there. They're already doing some things. So I love being able to impact them on that level. I felt like I had a huge impact on the high school level because for one, I wasn't super far from removed from their age group. So I still was able to relate to a lot of things they were going through as, as young black men and women. Um, so I, I love that aspect of high school, being able to really, really talk to them and, and they get it. Middle school, they might get it, they might not. You have some that were a little more mature, you can have those conversations and you have some that are just not. So that's the biggest thing I probably really miss about high school is that realness I could have with the kids. Um, and then, we do have a bigger Hispanic demographic than I had at Brainerd, but I mean, they're, they're awesome. They're so sweet. Um, and you have, we have real conversations with them as well. They're still a minority and they, they still have a lot of those stereotypes placed on them the same way our, um, Brown is Brown, you know, the same way our, our black kids did and still do. So really just, um, making sure they understand their worth and they're not just here for a stereotype of to work our land, you know, um, I hate that, that they get that stereotype. But um, we try to really hone in on their, um, like we have their flags and stuff displayed in the school and 
their hair, Spanish Heritage Month in October, you know, things like that to really make sure that they know that we really respect and want to honor their culture. I think that's really exciting. So I do love that aspect of, of being able to impact that demographic because I'm from California. So that's like, that's it. Like it's all, it's, it's the whole, all Mexican, you know, over there, over here, they call it more Hispanic, but they were all Mexican from Mexico in California. Um, so that's all I grew up with when I went to, um, in through school, it was Mexican, black and Filipino. So um, being able to bring that back full circle and really work with them now has been a really a blessing too. So love it. I love it. I love it. So hold on. Cause I know Dante's Dante's going to ask you the last question, but we got to pay some bills real quick. So give me one second. Listen, guys, this is the class and session podcast, right? Make sure, listen, 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 make sure that you subscribe, like, and comment. All right. And leave a review again. If you feel that we're adding value again, if you feel that we are adding value with this podcast, share it with people, leave a review, give us some feedback. All right. All right, Dante, let's get it. All right. So now that we didn't, you know, shared your story mm -hmm. um, and everybody know where you know, basically skyrocket and, you know, been through a little adversity, but then got to a better position now. Uh -huh. um, for our audience, can you give them some strategies um, on the teacher level, um, on the math coaching level, some stuff that they can, can so I, like, like we say, some educators, maybe some principals, counselors, right. whoever it may be. Can you give them some strategies or something that maybe they can take from this podcast that can help them? I mean, of course, everybody can't go viral like Ms. G, so you know. They can't, but, fortunately. You know, but uh, <laughs> some strategies or something that um, that can help somebody. Absolutely. Um, the biggest thing that I will say, and this is on all levels, administration, teaching, coaching, is to build relationships with your people. So whether you're a teacher with your student, your scholars, whether you are a coach, you need to build those relationships with your teachers and in administration, building those relationships with your teachers. Um, that's going to take you further than anything. And that's what took me further than anything. It, but not just to say, yeah, I know them. We got a relationship. No, a genuine. Ask about them. Ask, know what people, what makes people tick. What make, Show that genuine interest in whoever it is that you're serving. Because at the end of the day, we are serving. So I'm serving my kids. I'm Now I'm going to be serving my teachers and my kids. So um, really building that foundation and that culture where it's, it's, you have rapport with them, um, that genuine interest on any level. If you, do, if you don't do that, you will have nothing. Like you won't have, like I said, I can have my kids do anything for me. I want to have that same impact on teachers where they'll do anything. Look, Ms. Gladney going to have our backs. We coming to work and we working hard no matter what. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. They're just 20 years older. It's the same thing. So really building that where you make that lasting impact because they know that you care. Um, that's, your num that's your number one go-to. So if you're wanting to get into education you're already in, you're just struggling, Take a step back and get to know people. Get to know who you're serving. And that, that goes for any industry, but definitely in education. Get to know who you're serving. That's going to take you a long way. Um, and then beyond that, just on, like as a teacher, have, be structured, consistent. Um, structure, though. They crave structure. You feel like kids don't. Kids do crave the structure. So have those structures in place. Have your routines in place. Start off week one. We go into the routines every day. Like, Routines, structures. I've done a lot of um, professional development, like district wide, on that. Just making sure you have those um, non negotiables in place so that your kids know when I accept Ms. Gladney class, this is what she's expecting. And it's going to be that way every day, not for the first month. And then after that, well, we do what we want to do. No, be consistent. Stay stick true to whatever you say is your non negotiable and your routines. They walk in, get their notebook, and start their warm up. Then that's what they need to do every day. You want to play music? Play your music every day. Like, stay. Um, consistent with whatever it is that you set forth and then even going to leadership is the same thing be consistent with it support your teachers um if you say i'm gonna do what you say you're going to do and that's been one of the biggest compliments i got this summer um because i was the director of our summer camp and a teacher had told um one of the like my leader our chief of staff <laughs> so i was like i was like oh she said it to her that's good but she had told her like Whatever Ms. Gladney told her she was going to do this summer, she did it. When I, she told me, you have a, a misbehaving kid, call me. I'm on the way. She came and got them. And she, whatever consequence she told us from the start she was going to do, that's what she did. 
And that's that goes a long way with um, when teachers know that you're going to um, stick to whatever expectation you set forth and be um, follow through, follow up and be consistent in whatever you say you're going to do. So that's my that's my two things. Relationships first, be consistent, um, set expectations and stick to them and be structured. That's that's good. That's good. So just for our audience out there, um, I think I want to key in on the word serving. Um, a lot of people um, don't understand that word serving. Um, she did say she served her students and now she serves her teachers and students because she's a principal. So I think that's big. And another big thing she said is um, students crave structure. Yes. So let's say that one more time. Students crave structure, structure. Which, is a, which is a real big thing. Um, so you need that organization in place. And I like the thing of the non-negotiable. Um, so for y'all teachers out there, make sure you have a non-negotiable in there, which basically means that there is a that rule applies no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. Um, I, I really think that's a big deal and it can help a lot of people. Miss G dropping some gems. Logan, we got to get a little, little, little bomb machine for them because she dropped a few out there. So we got we got to get that. Absolutely. 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 Miss G, before we get out of here, um, I just want to give you your flowers um, and tell you thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for what you do. I know it's not easy. Um, I, know, I know it's not easy at all because I know all of the red tape and the politics and all of that type of stuff. I know you got to go through all of that. But I appreciate you just staying the course. I appreciate you being an educator. I appreciate you being an assistant principal. And so I just want to give you your flowers now. I know when the schools, I know when school starts, you'll probably see me. I, I'll be telling you again. Um, but I just want to say thank you for for everything that you do for the kids in the community because it is it's definitely worth it, and you're definitely seeing the impact that you make. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys doing this, and really. This will really help a lot of people understand, you know, a little bit more about education. And then if you are already an educator, hopefully you're really listening to what some educators are doing and being successful at. So this is great. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, guys, listen, before we get up out of here, listen, man, make sure again, man, I can't tell y'all this enough. Make sure that you like, subscribe and comment. OK. Mm -hmm. Leave us a podcast review, all right? Leave us a review. If you're rocking with us, you're rocking with YB Normal, you're rocking with the Class and Session podcast, leave us a review, all right? Mm -hmm. And listen, guys, before we get hold, out hold of on, here. Hold on, hold on, Also, What's also, Miss G, make sure you're telling me information because she did say she was um, a team lead and math instructional coach, correct? Oh, yes. definitely. Yeah, do that real so, quick, Miss G. Where can they reach you at? Because you might be teaching some master classes or be doing some personal development. Yeah, you might you might be them blowed up or something, be in the Department of Education, you know, three years from now. So yeah. Let um, them know my, everything about it. Yeah, my main um social media platform is just Facebook. So it's just my name, Ariana Gladney. Um, and my page is public. I don't really got nothing to hide. So um you can reach me there, friend requests, you know, messenger, messenger, anything like that. I will say I used to tutor, I don't tutor anymore, I don't have time. Um, but I do know some tutors um, in the area. So if you're looking for that, I maybe can plug you in with that. Um, or if you're looking for a job, we always have things coming up. So definitely reach out to me. Um, I'm definitely going to plug that. We always have something coming up. You know, like you said, people leave they're leaving. So <laughs> you just never know. So, um, yeah, you can reach me on Facebook, Ariana Gladney. Um, I'm there. All right. Wonderful. Cool. Well, listen, guys, before we get out of here, man, listen. This is the Class and Session Podcast. I am your host, Logan Taylor, with my partner in crime, my brother, my co-host, Mr. Dante Hampton. And listen, guys, make sure you all subscribe, all right? And before we get out of here, like we always say, why be normal? When you can be extraordinary. You can be extraordinary. All right, we'll see y'all soon. Peace. Thank y'all.